everyone. Our, our next guest speaker has an illustrious career in the Foreign Service, serving at critical moments of the U.S.-Russia relationship, ranging from the Russia-Georgia War in 2008 to the reset of the Russian-American relationship. He also has a profound uh, family historical connection with his father fighting alongside the Red Army after escaping a uh, German prison camp during World War II. He shared that story recently in uh, the ambassadorial series produced by the Monterey Initiative in Russian Studies. If you haven't seen that yet, I highly recommend it. And the events are also chronicled in the book Behind Hitler's Lines. What is special about Ambassador Byerly is that he turned that family connection into an opportunity. And as ambassador, he frequently hosted World War II veterans at the U.S. ambassador residence in Moscow's Spasso House uh, to commemorate the joint victory of that alliance. Also, Ambassador Byerly was the first U.S. ambassador to Russia to use his own blog in Russian to communicate directly with the Russian audience. Now, he's the native of Muskegon, Michigan, and alum of Grand Valley State University and the National War College, where he later taught as a visiting professor of national security studies. He speaks Bulgarian, Czech, French, German, and Russian. And today he'll be talking with us about diplomacy at the highest level. Ambassador Byerly, it's an honor. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Alex. Great to be with uh, everybody today. Uh, the focus of our, our discussions uh, when I join you are going to be basically some specific aspects of U.S.-Russia relations that I was personally uh, involved in. Today, we're going to go back about uh, 25 years to a period just after the Soviet Union collapsed when I was working at the National Security Council, directly responsible for U.S.-Russia relations. Uh, and then on Friday, we're going to lighten up a little bit. Uh, we'll take a look at the role that cultural diplomacy has played in, in U.S.-Soviet and U.S.-Russia relations. Uh, but uh, let's get started on today. And today's focus is based on the case study that you all read that was assigned, the, called the Long Goodbye, Withdrawal of uh, Russian Forces from the Baltic States. And I wrote that... Uh, about 25 years ago, while I was taking a year off at the studying at the National Defense University in Washington, after having worked a couple of intensive years uh, on the National Security Council staff, when I was actually responsible for the policy toward the, the new Russian Federation at that time and the other newly independent states of the ex-USSR, including the Baltic states. So there are two things today that I think uh, I want to try to uh, examine or draw lessons from. Uh, the first is the dilemma or the dynamic that small states uh, have to exercise when they try to defend their national security interests against a big and powerful neighbor. Uh, we're talking about the Balts in Russia, obviously, but we could also be talking about uh, lessons for Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis Russia, uh, the Central American states vis-a-vis -vis the United States. It's this dynamic of very small country, very big neighbor. Uh, so that's the first angle on this. The second angle is really uh, the role of personality, the role that personal chemistry plays in negotiations at the highest level. Uh, I think it's greatly undervalued. Uh, although, uh, for instance, President Biden in Geneva just uh, a couple of weeks ago in his meeting with Putin said that all foreign policy is a logical extension of personal relationships. And that's absolutely true, and it is decisive. Uh, we're talking not just about uh, Boris Yeltsin and the Baltic leaders, as we were in the case study, but in the discussion, we can expand that a little bit and talk about Putin and Trump, Putin and Biden. Uh, it's a very re rich subject. And uh, I think this case study in particular really illustrates the importance of it. Uh, I also wanna examine the advantages and the drawbacks uh, of outside powers engaging in the bilateral relations between states. Uh, the Soviets and the, the Russian Federation after them, and not only them, have continually laid down markers about the impermissibility of the uh, of interference in the internal affairs of the USSR, of the Russian Federation. But uh, I think you'll see that in some cases, uh, 
interference or let's call it involvement or engagement can actually be quite beneficial. Uh, so that's the third thing I want to look at today. And finally, uh, we'll look at how states manage contradictory interests, uh, spotlighting the different perspectives, the divergent interests of various parties, big and small, in the resolution of uh, complex political military disputes. So that, okay, was kind of a long preface to get us into the actual case study of the withdrawal of Russian forces from the Baltic states in the mid 1990s. So let's set the scene a little bit. When the Clinton administration came to power in January 1993, President Clinton made clear pretty early on that his top foreign policy priority was gonna be Russia, specifically an activist policy that was designed to reach out to Russia as Russia navigated this new road that we and the Russian leadership and the Russian people hoped in 1993 would lead to a market economy and a democratic social and political structure. And we in the United States, President Clinton also wanted to try to break down the mistrust and the hostility uh, which had built up during the Cold War, which characterized the Cold War. We talked about this at the time uh, in using the metaphor of the open window. It was very clear that a window had opened up, a window of opportunity, literally, uh, and nobody knew, we didn't know, no one in Russia knew how long that window was going to stay open. Uh, there was every possibility in 1993, 1994, that this would be a brief interlude, that Boris Yeltsin would be swept away, the communists or the nationalists would come back to power. So this was a very top-down policy, very hands-on from the very beginning. And in the case study, we, uh, I described a, a, very er, a very early meeting that uh, we had with President Clinton, where he identified getting the Russian military out of the Baltic states as a kind of special priority for him. Obviously the top priority in terms of US-Russia relations at that time was denuclearization. Uh, that was an existential issue for us uh, that took pride of place. We spent a lot of time working on that as well. Uh, but the withdrawal of Russian forces from the Baltics was a kind of special priority for Clinton. Gorbachev had already started uh, a major drawdown of Soviet forces in the Warsaw Pact countries in Central and Eastern Europe in 1989-1990, before the Soviet Union uh, even started to collapse. Uh, and at that time, the enlisted personnel in the Baltic states, the rank and file soldiers, mostly they were soldiers, started to leave then as well. The problem in the Baltics was the officer corps. The officer corps was more or less permanently stationed and living in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia with their families. And if and when they were to be withdrawn back to Russia, uh, they were going to have to find a place to live in a Russia that at that time was already in an economic beginning, an economic freefall. Uh, and by the mid-1990s, there was a serious housing shortage in Russia. There's always been a housing shortage in the Soviet Union, but it was especially acute uh, in 92, 93 through 95. Uh, and so the military started to resist these withdrawals and there were dueling images in the press of both country that created negative feelings on both sides. In the Russian Federation, when you talked about the withdrawal of Russian forces from the Baltics, there was immediately a picture on the screen, on the TV screen, of people living in tents. I mean, literally, some of the Russian officers and their families had to live in tents temporarily before they found, you know, more permanent housing in Russia. But the image of that was searing, uh, and there was a lot of resentment building up on the Russian side. In the United States, in Europe, in the Baltic states, uh, the military's resistance to leaving was seen as a kind of revanchist form of intimidation. 
and the perception that the Russian military and the Russian leadership in the Kremlin was resisting withdrawing their forces from the Baltics really undermined the personal and the popular backing that was needed to support reform in Russia, which President Putin said was his major goal because it's hard to reform, it's hard to support reform in Russia if it didn't really look like Russia was reforming and if the military wasn't willing to pull its forces out of independent sovereign countries, if they wanted to be, be de facto semi-permanent occupiers, what kind of reform was that? Uh, how is Congress gonna appropriate money for uh, helping Russia's economic uh, reforms, for example? And in those days, in, in 1993, US assistance to Russia overall was around $1 billion, a lot of money in 1993, a lot of money now. Uh, but Congress was watching what was happening in Russia very warily as they appropriated this money. And they began to pass legislation that linked the continuation of aid to Russia to significant progress in the withdrawal of forces from the Baltic states. So this quickly escalated. It escalated from being one issue on the agenda to actually becoming a major problem that we and the Europeans spend a lot of our time trying to, trying to resolve. And it was obviously an enormous existential issue for the Baltic states as well. I mean, what could be more existential, existential than that? Uh, for Russia, it was a smaller issue, but uh, what it lacked in size, it made up for in pain. Uh, a very, very painful issue for the Russians. So let's look at this uh, analytically a little bit. Let's try to examine the uh, factors that were influencing the various sides in this. The questions, the main questions are, uh, where do small states find the leverage to even out their disadvantage in dealing with Russia? And what are Moscow's interests? What are Moscow's attitudes uh, as it uh, deals with the countries that that it used to rule over. So um, we'll start by, by taking a look at uh, this kind of geographical representation kind of, of where we are, just to give you a size of the, uh, a sense of the size disparity here. It's a very small part of Russia that we're looking at. Uh, the, the Baltic states, it, it kind of magnifies in a way how small the Baltic states are. Uh, and the Baltic states obviously also have a very long history with this big neighbor to their east, uh, Imperial Russia, the Soviet Union. Uh, the three Baltic states have uh, built up a lot of animus resentment towards Russia in this period. So let's take a look at what the specific uh, factors were that were influencing the Baltic states as they deal with Russia. The first was security and the fear that this thaw that we were seeing, this open window was only temporary, uh, that it could be shut in almost no time at all. Uh, the fact that Baltic borders essentially are just lines on the map. There, there, there are no mountains, there are hardly any hills, so some small rivers. Militarily, they're pretty indefensible, even against a small not to mention a country the size of Russia. And third, there were no security guarantees at that time. NATO enlargement to the Baltic states is still 10 years in the future. Uh, NATO enlargement to the first three, Czech Republic, Poland, and Hungary is still three years off. So there, there are no written guarantees for the Baltics in any of this. And they're looking to the West. They're looking at us to give them whatever help we can give them. Secondly, the historical legacy, which, which I mentioned, um, the resentment that the Balts felt over the brutal occupation that they uh, endured during the Soviet occupation and the desire they felt for some kind of recompense. Uh, there's an instinctual refusal to defer to Russia's pretensions of uh, great power superiority in the region. And there's also historically a very clear view in the Baltic, from the Baltic perspective, of how the West failed to react in 1940, 1941, when the Baltic states were absorbed into the Soviet Union. 
they felt abandoned and they were very worried based on the historical record that they were at risk of being abandoned once, the, once again. In terms of domestic politics, these are very new states. They have weak parliamentary coalitions, weak institutions, and they also have uh, a very interesting internal political dynamic in which there are far right, virulently anti-Russian parties, which have significant uh, representation in the parliaments of all three states. And these parties have a zero tolerance policy toward anything, uh, any kind of accommodation with Russia. Uh, not a very practical thing for a small state. Uh, if you're going to deal with Russia at some point, you got to be thinking about a compromise. Uh, you can't really be basing things on a zero tolerance. So that created a lot of stress. Uh, militarily, there were 30,000 Russian Soviet troops in the Baltic states. And there were suspicions and a little bit of evidence that, that there was military activity going on under cover of these military forces based in the Baltics that was actively working to subvert Baltic and Soviet independence. Whether that was uh, true, dominant or not, the many in the Balts, in the Baltic states believed that. Uh, and diplomatically, uh, you've got very young and experienced government officials. And ironically, many of the Baltic diplomats uh, of that time had trained in Russia. They had worked in the Russian military, uh, in the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, they knew their counterparts on the other side, on the Russian side. They had worked together. They were, had been former colleagues. Uh, and their colleagues, former colleagues, knew them very well uh, uh, also, knew their, weeks, uh, their weaknesses, knew their strengths. Uh, and it was hard for many uh, in the Baltic diplomatic corps to imagine that they could really do it on their own, that they were going to be able to hold their own against Russia diplomatically. Again, why they looked in our direction for the West, to the West for some help. So that's sort of from the Baltic point of view, let's take a look at the, uh, the view from Russia. What were the factors that were influencing Russia as it dealt with the Baltics? Uh, obviously domestic politics, uh, a very acute sense that uh, their Soviet empire had been lost, the, the deterioration of living standards that I talked about, and a concomitant rise of Russian nationalism at the same time. To, sort of redress this uh, painful feeling that they, they'd lost a lot in a very, very short time. Uh, socially and demographically, uh, there was a fear on the part of the Russians, the Russian military, that they might actually be physically at risk in the Baltic states from a kind of payback discrimination. Uh, and there were some uh, attacks that, you know, they were very sporadic, uh, nothing sustained, but it took only one or two of those uh, for Russians to begin to imagine that uh, this was a real problem for them that they needed to push, push back against. Uh, in the military, the military really felt that they'd gotten the short end of the stick when the Soviet Union fell apart. And there was unrest in the officer corps. And this was something that uh, the reformers surrounding Boris Yeltsin had to deal with. Uh, these were very conservative elements of the Russian, Soviet Russian political uh, landscape. And they couldn't be ignored. Uh, they were powerful voices. Uh, and diplomatically, in the same way, there was a split between those who welcomed the collapse of the Soviet Union wanted to try to use that to finally reform the country and the conservatives who felt that they would lose everything, that the West was going to take advantage of them. They didn't want any Western assistance. They thought Western assistance was a Trojan horse. And frankly, you hear some of this even today as Russians, Russian leaders look back to that period, the 1990s. Uh, Vladimir Putin has a a famous quote in which he said, when the Soviet Union fell apart, our Russians biggest mistake was trusting you in the West. And your biggest mistake was taking advantage of our trust. Uh, the seeds, the beginnings of that 
feeling were already becoming apparent uh, at that time. And at the same time, you had in Boris Yeltsin, a president who was reaching out actively to the West, who was going out of his way to develop uh, political and personal relationships with Bill Clinton, German, French, British leaders at the time. Very interesting dynamics at work there. For us in the United States, uh, the factors that influenced our involvement were basically three. They were the ties to the Baltic states. We had substantial emigrate communities uh, in Chicago, Cleveland, other <laughs> cities, mostly in the Northeast. Uh, we had also kept the flame alive for the Baltic states after they were absorbed into the Soviet Union. We, the United States, refused to recognize that. Uh, it was a, a very symbolic act, but it said something important about our commitment and the Baltics remembered it and looked for us to continue to show that commitment to their independence and sovereignty now when it really counted. And we also spent a lot of time and needed to spend a lot of time ensuring that we were well coordinated with our European allies so that when we spoke to the Russians and we spoke to the Baltics, uh, we had the combined weight of the Europeans and the Americans making suggestions pushing when we needed to push. Uh, we also obviously had ties to a very new Russia. I talked about Clinton's uh, new policy, which he called the Alliance with Russian Reform, the assistance programs I talked about, and this idea uh, that began to gain currency after a famous article was written in Foreign Policy by Carl Bildt uh, called the Baltic Litmus Test. And the idea was that if Russia wasn't willing to pull its forces out of the Baltic states in some sort of uh, agreed manner, then how could we trust them to do the denuclearization steps that we were hoping to have them do? How could we trust them to be moving toward a more democratic, uh, open political system? The Baltics, uh, as small as that issue was in a landscape of huge things that needed to get done. It was seen as a litmus test, uh, especially in the US Congress. And that takes us to domestic policy and the criticism that the Clinton administration was uh, undergoing even by 1993, 1994 uh, over uh, some real foreign policy and, and military debacles in Somalia, the Black Hawk, Black Hawk Down incident, uh, Boris Yeltsin's shelling of the Russian parliament in 1993. Boris Yeltsin had stood on a tank and stood up to the communists in 1991. By 1993, some of the luster, some of the shine had rubbed off a bit as he was seen as actually using force against his own people. And there was a lot of criticism as the years went on that uh, Bill Clinton was really over personalizing the relationship with Boris Yeltsin. The Bill and Boris show as it became, uh, as it came to be called, was, began to be criticized uh, as Bill Clinton being sold a bill of goods by a charismatic Boris Yeltsin. Nothing could have been farther from the truth in actuality, but that was the perception. So, Negotiations between Moscow and the three Baltic states had begun in February of 1992, two months after the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, Lithuania was done first, and by August uh, 1993, in a relatively smooth manner, Russian troops were out of Lithuania. Uh, there were fewer troops th there. The, issue really uh, didn't turn into the hot button issue that it later developed uh, into in Latvia and uh, Estonia. Uh, when things stalled with the Lithuanians, the Europeans threatened to block Russia's entry into the Council of Europe. This is the first time that we started to pull out some sticks to go along with the carrots that we were offering the newly independent Russia at that point. Washington reminded the Kremlin that Congress had passed this law 
cutting off assistance if there wasn't significant progress toward withdrawal. And traditionally, there were better relations between Russia and the Lithuanians. So that was done by August of 1993, and that left two, Latvia and Estonia. And as 1993 wore on, uh, it began to feel like time was really kind of running out. Uh, we might have missed that window that I was talking about. In December of 1993, there were parliamentary elections for the Russian Duma, uh, in which the communists and nationalist parties and candidates uh, made a real comeback, a very frightening comeback. Uh, that was the first time we ever heard of a guy named Vladimir Zhirinovsky. His party, which even then was called the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, LDPR, got 20 percent of the vote. And both sets of negotiations at that point were, were stalled. Latvia at that time was also complicated by the presence of Soviet ballistic early warning radar sites. One particular site in the town of Skrunda. The Russians argued that they would need years to build a replacement for this early warning radar site. And we in the United States, we were very sympathetic to this argument. The last thing that we wanted to see at that point was Russia having a blind spot in its strategic nuclear field of vision. The Latvians were under a lot of domestic pressure because the radar and the area around it that was controlled by the Soviets and the Russians was seen really as a Trojan horse that uh, was essentially controlled by the KGB and they would use that to do who knows what. It was seen as a big security risk. Uh, plus it was just a monstrosity of a building. Uh, again, symbolically, very important as a symbol of something that the Latvians wanted to tear down. Um, the Russians said they needed to occupy this for another eight to 10 years. That was a total non-starter for the Latvians. But the Latvians didn't have the technical expertise to negotiate that down. They didn't have any real nuclear strategic technical experts on that side on their side. We on the US did have that expertise. And so we proposed a compromise. We said, okay, not eight to 10 years, four years. The Russians will pay rent and then they will take it down. The Russians said that they would accept this. Uh, it took a phone call from Clinton to Yeltsin to seal the deal. Uh, and, and ironically, but not so ironic, if you remember what we talked about earlier, the Latvians were a harder sell on this. Uh, because of this zero tolerance policy that I talk of, because of pressure from their rightist nationalist parties. They, they, I remember the Latvian ambassador in Washington at that point said, there are people in Riga who see a KGB officer under every bed these days. So what do we do? The Russians are ready for a deal, but the Latvians are. So we in the National Security Council staff came up with a plan. The plan was this, Clinton would call the Latvian president and he would invite the Latvian president, President Ulmanis, to send a delegation to Washington made up of the Latvian politicians who opposed the deal. We would give them briefings, we would explain the technical rationale behind the four years and uh, President Clinton called President Ulmanis to make this offer to him. So here's a picture from 25 years ago, yours truly taking notes as Clinton with his typically very busy desk, a lot of books on it, crossword puzzle there somewhere you can't see, uh, was talking to Olmanis. And uh, Olmanis saw the value in this right away. So the delegation came in, came to Washington, and we set up a meeting for them in the Roosevelt Room of the White House, right across from the Oval Office in the West Wing. Uh, we introduced the group, they sat down. We were ready to start giving them the first of their briefings, why four years was a good deal. And suddenly the door opens and Vice President Gore walks in. Everybody stands up, he walks around, gives handshakes, 
they're ready to see him walk out the door, feeling good the vice president even did a drop by, and instead he sits down. And for 20 minutes, he tells them why four years is a good deal. He was very well briefed, had a great staff, great national security advisor, Leon Firth, uh, and he was a smart guy, and he sold it for 20 minutes. Stood up, shook hands, said goodbye, opened the door. As he walked out, the door opened and President Clinton walks in. <laughs> President Clinton walks in, handshakes all around. By this time, the Latvian parliamentary delegation is in a daze uh, because we had not told them anything about this at all. We couldn't because you don't know, there might've been a crisis and neither Gore nor Clinton would have been able to show up. You don't, last thing you wanna do is say, the, these two, these two, the vice president, president are gonna stop by and then they don't show up. So, uh, you know, I won't say that the Lapian delegation was putty in our hands at that point, uh, but they certainly were leaning a bit further in our direction than, uh, than they had been. Uh, another example of how engagement at the highest levels can really be decisive. Uh, and we had also coordinated with the Swedes and the Germans uh, for them to do a version of the same thing by sending high level delegations to Latvia before and after this delegation got back to kind of uh, reinforce uh, the argument. Uh, and so by the time that President Yeltsin met with Olmanis in Moscow, the deal was basically done. The Russian forces had been withdrawn. Hang on a second here, I get my screen. I apologize for my... Okay, you can still see me, right? Sorry about that. Okay, so two down, one to go, Estonia left. Now you'd think that the Estonians, uh, having seen Russia make a deal with Lithuania and the Latvians, you would think that the Estonians would feel better about their own chances at this point, and, and they should have, but they didn't. They felt isolated. They felt like they were gonna be left high and dry. Uh, they could see that each agreement First, the Lithuanians, then the Latvians caused a stronger backlash from the hardliners in Russia. And as you read in the case study, uh, the bilateral negotiations between the Russians and the Estonians uh, broke down around the time that the Latvian deal was actually being signed. And, and we could actually feel things were hardening on the Russian side. Uh, we knew that we were going to have to, again, broker some sort of a deal just to get things over the finish line. So again, we came up with a plan. Um, the G7 had a meeting scheduled in Naples, July, 1994. And we arranged to have President Clinton fly into Latvia on his way to Naples. Uh, this would be the first to Latvia, I said, not, not Estonia, we'll talk about that in a second. This, would, this was the first visit ever by a sitting US president to the Baltics. We had a non-recognition policy during the Soviet Union, uh, but now the president could go, huge symbolism. And this was a chance for President Clinton to meet personally with the Estonian president uh, and then go to Naples for the G7 with Yeltsin. It was, we were setting up kind of uh, shuttle diplomacy. Uh, the G7 was still the G7 at that point, but Russia had been invited uh, as a candidate member, sort of, to the political discussions. Another thing that uh, Clinton had pushed hard on with the Europeans. Uh, but wait a minute. He's flying into Riga. Why, you ask, is he not flying to Tallinn? Anybody have any idea? There's a very specific reason why that happened. But you'll know it only if you read the footnotes of the case study. Anybody remember? Very prosaic reason. As we set this up, we were going to have President Clinton fly into Tallinn. But when the Air Force did the advance, they discovered that the runway in Tallinn was too short for big 747 Air Force One to land. 
Now, as soon as they found out about that, the Estonians immediately started work on lengthening the runway, but there wasn't enough time for the concrete to dry. Uh, and so they did a site survey in Riga and discovered that the runway was long enough. Sometimes it's the very prosaic things like that that determine why things happen. But it, it worked out okay. The Estonian president came to Riga. He had a meeting with President Clinton and he got a letter from him with a proposal for the last compromises that were needed between Moscow and Tallinn. And the agreement was that President Clinton was going to deliver that letter to Yeltsin in Naples and then get him to agree to a meeting with the, uh, with the Estonian president, okay? Now, these are the days when the United States uh, had really a lot of sway international. We, uh, to use a very 20th century expression, we used to say the United States had a kind of good housekeeping seal of approval. Uh, the Russians and the Estonians didn't trust each other, but each side did trust the United States and trust the Clinton administration. So if we were willing to vouch for this, uh, that, that counted for something uh, between the Russians, uh, with both the Russians and the Estonians. So Clinton, melt, uh, Clinton met with Yeltsin uh, on the margins of the G7 in Naples. He handed over the, the letter and uh, Yeltsin agreed to have a meeting with the Estonian president to seal the deal. But then Clinton, as he actually described in a later interview, it might be in his uh, memoirs too, I can't remember. Uh, he got over his skis a little bit too much and they decided to hold a joint press conference. Fast forward to Geneva a few weeks ago where we decided not to hold a joint press conference, but Yeltsin uh, and Clinton agreed they would do a joint press conference uh, and in that press conference, the president, Clinton, said that he was confident, based on his discussion with Yeltsin, that the Russians and the Estonians would leave, would, uh, would agree that Russian forces would leave Estonia by August 31st, in about six weeks. Never do that. Never set a date certain, if you can possibly avoid it. Now, we were watching all of this back in Washington. We had been uh, with the president in Latvia for the meeting, but we flew back to Washington. We didn't go to Naples for the G7. So we were watching this press conference on CNN. And during the question and answer, the first question went to Yeltsin. And he was asked, Mr. President, uh, President uh, Clinton says you will have all forces out of Estonia by August 31st. Will you? And Yeltsin, listen to the translation. He got that kind of steely look. He kind of drew himself up, big barrel chested guy, and we knew what was coming. And he said, Nyet, Nyet. Lithuania, we agreed. Latvia, we agreed. But Estonia is violating the human rights of our officers. And so we have a long way to go. Well, it was damage control time. Uh, Yeltsin had agreed that he would meet his Estonian counterpart. But all that anybody focused on was yet it sort of hung in the air like a bad odor for days, for weeks. And so we spent the next week trying to get things back on the rails. And finally, uh, the Russians told the Estonians, OK, come come to Moscow sometime the end of July. But there was no agenda. And when the Russian and Estonian uh, working levels got together to try to prepare for this Yeltsin Leonard Mary meeting. Mary was the president of Estonia. Uh, the Russians were not in a mood to work anything out at all. In fact, at the end of those meetings, the two sides were farther apart than they had been when they started. Uh, you know, in high level meetings, usually the principals, the two presidents, come into a situation ideally which has been agreed by their foreign ministers or at high levels of the government and they're left with 10 or 15 percent you know fill in the numbers or shake the hand they, they sort of seal the deal they're not they're supposed to negotiate a lot at that level but it was looking as though they might have to and that was a, a source of great worry uh, for us and for the Estonians 
So it all came down to this meeting between the two presidents. And based on the way things had been going, uh, we had to really prepare for the absolute worst. Um, so before, <laughs> before we, let me see if I can uh, somehow magically resuscitate that PowerPoint, apologies again. Before we talk about that meeting, I wanted to take a look at the two protagonists. Okay, so uh, let's just quickly uh, look at the two personages. Uh, Leonard Mary, president of uh, Estonia, 55 at that time, and he's what the Russians would call a real intelligent uh, author, filmmaker, poet. He's also got a very sad personal history. His family was deported to Siberia in 1941. Uh, Mary is somebody who is a very disciplined guy, doesn't drink at all, and he's a fluent Russian speaker, obviously. Not only did he grow up in the Soviet Union, he worked as a lumberjack as a teenager in Siberia. So not only does he speak fluent Russian, he, he speaks, he knows how to curse, how to swear in Russian, which is part of the, the richness of the Russian language. His counterpart, Boris Yeltsin, also about the same age, but not what the Russians would call an intelligent. Uh, he's uh, an engineer by training and obviously rose through the ranks of the Communist Party to become the first secretary of essentially the mayor of Moscow, city party committee in those days. Pretty big job. Uh, famously, Yeltsin is not a teetotaler. Uh, and as I mentioned, he's someone with a kind of controversial history. He stood up uh, to be a Democrat, but then shelled the Russian parliament uh, two years later. So these are the two guys. Now, as we saw, Mary arrives at the Kremlin for what was to be a 90 minute scheduled meeting. Two men had never met before. And Yeltsin opens the meeting by reading from a very harsh, hard line text that could have been written by Zhivinovsky. And it seemed to set up a, a collapse. The Estonians told me later that they thought when he's done reading this, the whole Russian delegation is just going to get up and walk out of the room. That was the atmosphere, the chill that he sent by, by reading this. But President Mary, President Mary, our poet, our intelligence, practiced a really brilliant piece of personal diplomacy here. He had a substantial command of history, obviously, and he began to talk about the historical and the cultural links between the Russian and the Estonian people. And after going on like this for about 15 or 20 minutes, of course, in fluent Russian, uh, Yeltsin warmed up. He began to respond with uh, a little more personal warmth. Uh, and that had been Mary's hope and plan all along. Mary explained what the last sticking point in the withdrawal plan was. And uh, Yeltsin said, oh, it didn't sound to be much of a problem to him. Why don't we ask our two foreign ministers to work out the details. This is what the great men do quite often. Uh, when they wanna go do something else, they delegate it to, in this case, their foreign ministers. And Yeltsin uh, retired or suggested that they retire for what in my case study I describe as a, a late lunch. Now I called it a late lunch in the case study at the specific request of my Estonian uh, sources who didn't want the real story to come out when the case study was published in 1996. This was just two years after the event when Yeltsin and Mary were both still presidents. Uh, what the late lunch turned out to be was Mary and Yeltsin, remember this is uh, in the Kremlin, uh, re retiring to a room which basically had bottles and glasses on the table. And according to protocol, Yeltsin made us toast, Mary answered, they drank, uh, and then Mary very shrewdly understood that he, even though he's a teetotaler, uh, he didn't need to stop, he should not stop at the protocol point. And they can, he continued to match Yeltsin drink for drink. Yeltsin suggested they go to a sauna. Mary being a good Estonian, sure, let's go to the sauna. They continued discussing this in the sauna and came out after a couple of hours 
ready to sign an agreement which their two foreign ministers have been working on uh, very hard. Uh, and here's a picture of that. In fact, here, this uh, guy in the middle is uh, Yuri Luik, the Estonian foreign minister. And you see that Mary and Yeltsin are toasting immediately after having signed the withdrawal agreement. And if you look closely at Yeltsin's face, it's a black and white photo. If it were a color photo, that kind of darkness would be very red. And frankly, Mary looks a little red in the face too. Uh, that's the way it's done sometimes at the highest level. That's the way it needs to be done when there's an important piece of business to get done. If you know your interlocutor and if you know what's at stake. And just one month after this picture was taken, August 31st, 1994, the last of the Russian military forces were withdrawn from Estonia. That's the end of the story.